Welcome to the Pen Light Bulb Cafe. Tonight's topic is Who's Afraid of Killer Robots? How robotics, 3D printing, and other innovations will affect the future of war. Our speaker is Michael C. Horowitz. He's an associate professor of political science at the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Horowitz will draw on his extensive research on military innovation, as well as his recent experience working in the Department of Defense to discuss key trends and technologies that will shape the future of warfare. From robots to lasers, the talk will focus on the challenges and opportunities for the United States and the world as the information age continues to shape the potential tools available for military. Dr. Horowitz spent 2013 working for the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Policy in the Department of Defense. He is the author of The Diffusion of Military Power, Causes and Consequences for International Politics, which won awards from the International Studies Association and the Mershon Center at the Ohio State University. His research interests include military innovation and the future of war, forecasting, the role of leaders in international politics, and the relationship between religion and conflict. His work has been published in many popular and academic journals. He has held fellowships at the Weatherhead Center at Harvard and the Olin Institute at Harvard. He received his PhD from the Department of Government at Harvard University and his BA in Political Science from Emory University. Tonight we will be videotaping as well as audio taping and we have a Google Hangout that you'll be able to see after this um, production. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Horowitz. Thanks, Jackie, and thanks to everybody for coming out despite the, the weather and the fact that it's tax day. I know, you know the federal government's probably taking a bunch of your money, and so today I'm gonna talk about other ways that the government is taking your money. Uh, in this case, uh, military spending. But, but this is a type of taking your money I think actually is, is, is legitimate, and, and that I think is important for thinking about the future of, of America's security and the future of the global security environment. So to start, think about, you know, imagine in your mind what you think are the most important threats to global stability. And in particular, a you know, large, powerful, wealthy country like the United States. Things that might come to mind include North Korea. And we have a, a propaganda poster here of uh, you know, the strong North Korea you know, crushing the United States. Maybe you think about Iran. We have a, a map here of Iran's nuclear facilities. Uh, which you know, many people are worried that Iran is seeking to acquire nuclear weapons and concerned with how that might affect uh, security in the Middle East and around the world. You know, third, China. This is a, a shot of China's new aircraft carrier, the, the first one that they've ever deployed, signifying significant advances that China's made in, in developing its military infrastructure and military capabilities over the last few decades. But I'm not going to talk about any of that today, although some of those countries will come up from, from time to time. Instead, what I'm going to talk about are, are essentially the, the, the technological horizon, and specifically how developments in information age technologies may shape the politics of warfare and affect the security of the United States. So to start, here's an example of a you know, sort of new type of military technology. This is the USS Ponce a U.S. naval vessel, and on this is, uh, is a laser, actually, a, a form of directed energy being deployed on a U.S. military ship uh, for the first time in a deployment. They, uh, they think if this laser works that it will be used primarily for things like air defense, you know, protecting U.S. ships from, from incoming uh, missiles or airplanes. It's an example of an area of technology that's moving from science fiction into reality. Here's another one, cyber war, which everyone, of course, is familiar with conceptually, even though nobody knows exactly what uh, it means, including me, to be fair. You know, essentially, we're talking about, you know, the use of computers, the use of, inform of, of information age connectivity to, to do things like the Stuxnet virus, which shut down uh, Iran's nuclear weapons program for a period of time, and potentially to you know, do things like take down power grids or cause other sorts of damage. Here's something that's even a little, more, a little more esoteric, a little bit different. 
This is a MakerBot printer, an example of some early commercial three-dimensional printing. You know, most of you, I'm sure, have a printer in your house that you've been using for years to, to print out boarding passes, to print out papers, to print out, you know, lots of, lots of different things. Right now, three-dimensional printers are primarily useful for printing, well, not a whole lot of stuff. I mean, think about whistles, uh, action figures. That's what people generally use 3D printers for. But for the first time this year, the US Navy, the same one that's deploying that directed energy weapon, is actually putting three-dimensional printers on three of its ships, with the idea being that sailors can use those printers to print replacement parts to try to keep the ship at sea longer, to try to decrease the wear and tear on it. But now here's something that's a little more dangerous. Last year, a company printed a three, uh, using a 3D printer printed a gun, an entirely plastic gun. You just put the bullet in and it fires. Now, of course, this was shut down several days later, but there's actually a legal firearms company now printing, I noticed everyone got really quiet when I talked about 3D printing uh, of a gun. The, there's actually a legal firearms company that's now using three-dimensional printing to print replacement parts legally for its firearms. Now those three-dimensional printers cost, cost thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars, not maybe the $1,000 that it would take to go out to Staples and buy what, you know, that maker bot that I showed you before, but it's another area where technology is advancing and could affect what the future of war looks like. The thing I'm gonna focus on the most today is robotics. This is a, a picture of an MQ-9 Reaper. You know, the US comes up always with you know, great names for our systems like Predator and Reaper and Fighting Falcon, you know, all sorts of fun stuff like that. This is the, the state of the art when it comes to unmanned aerial vehicles. And the US has used this to great effect in, in Afghanistan, in Pakistan, allegedly in other places. And the US is currently the leading country in the world when it comes to applying robotics to its military. The question that I'm thinking about a lot in my research and the question that I wanna you know, put to you today and, and get your perspective on you know, after my presentation is, is this going to last? And what will this mean for the United States? So you know, to understand this, what we need to understand is essentially how innovations spread. When countries invent new things, how do those end up spreading throughout the international system? Well, the way to understand this is the same way that you'd understand the way products spread. Things like the microwave, things like the, things like the iPhone, something like Netflix and how many people, and how many people are, are using it. On the vertical axis in this chart, you have what's called a, uh, you, on the vertical axis you have the total adopters, the number of people that have actually used a new technology. On the horizontal axis, you have the time since you know, somebody who invented something demonstrated it. And innovations all tend to follow this kind of S-curve. We have early adopters followed by you know, mass adoption where, where the, the rate of adoption accelerates, followed by things sort of tailing off. The interesting thing is that I think today, the period that we are at when it comes to military robotics is right at that takeoff stage, which is a particularly dangerous period. Because it means that while the United States has led the world from basically here up to here, there's no guarantee essentially that that will continue. And whether it does depends in part on what kind of military technology you think robotics will end up being. This matters because different kinds of military innovations spread differently. Some spread more slowly. Think about nuclear weapons. In contrast to John F. Kennedy's prediction that, that dozens of countries would acquire nuclear weapons by the 1970s or 1980s, it turns out it's actually really hard to build a nuclear weapon. I mean, don't get me wrong, you can do it. You can be, say, North Korea, put your nickels in a jar every, you know, every day for 40 years and end up getting a nuclear weapon, but it's actually really hard for, for lots of people to do. So you have difficult technologies with high capital costs like nuclear weapons that spread really slowly. In the middle, you have something like fighter aircraft, which, I mean, everybody understands how to build an airplane. So fighter aircraft have spread around the world. Advanced fighter aircraft, though, are actually kind of complicated. The integration of basic avionics with all of the, the whiz-bang stuff that countries like the United States and Russia use 
GPS technology, advanced weapons, you know, those kinds of things. So that's something in the middle. Now here's something that, sadly, you can basically walk through any major city in the world and trip over, and that's an AK-47. Thanks to our, our Russian friends, the AK-47 is ubiquitous with violence, essentially, around the world. There are millions, millions of them, literally, that have been produced. This is something that has spread very, very quickly. But one of the key factors that determines how quickly these sorts of things spread is whether the underlying basis of that technology tends to be something that's more exclusively military, something like, say, stealth technology, where you can kind of hold on to it, hold it tight, and make it difficult for other people to get it, versus things that have a lot more commercial applications. So things that have a lot more commercial applications where the business world is going to invest in them anyways, it's extremely difficult to control their spread. And those are the types of innovations that spread very quickly and can spread around the world and that you can't do uh, a whole lot about. And it's my contention that that's what we're dealing with when we're dealing with robotics. And that essentially innovation in robotics is accelerating. And that innovation is occurring along two different pathways. The, the first being non-military investments, and I'll spend a lot of time talking about that. Investments by companies like Google, by Rethink Robotics, by iRobot, in a burgeoning robotics market. The second is military investments. Lots of countries around the world are investing heavily in robotics, in part because they believe that it's a way to counter America's superiority. The US is the best in the world at warfare, and as, American, as, as an American, that's great, and I hope that that lasts. But America's military superiority is built on the fact that the United States has the best planes, the best aircraft carriers, I mean, essentially the only real aircraft carriers, the best personnel in the world. Robotics could offer rising powers the ability to challenge American superiority without having to master all those technologies that America is currently the best at, meaning that it, they have a strong incentive to work on these technologies. And I think this essentially leads to three questions that I'm going to go through. The first is, does this change what it means to go to war? If it's not soldiers going to war, and you think it back you know, from old school, sort of Greek and Roman, up to, uh, up to something like World War II and then up to the present, if what we're dealing with is actually push-button war, where the risk to soldiers on the battlefield decreases significantly, what does that mean for violence? The second is, what happens if we let the robots think for themselves? Now, we know the answer in the movies. It never goes well. You know, Terminator, Matrix, you know, whatever, you know, whatever. But the, are, will, would these kinds of weapons be legal, and would they be desirable? And what do we do if, say, they're desirable for other countries, even if they're not desirable for the United States? Which is the third question, and one that I spent some time working on last year when I was in the Defense Department, is what then should the United States do? And I think this is important because the stakes are high. The stakes of falling behind in what could become a robotics arms race, and what certainly will be the spread of robotics throughout lots of areas of civilian, business, and military life around the world, the cost of falling behind could be that military superiority that's made the United States the best in the world up to this point with another implication being then a potential shift, maybe, in how we think about warfare, getting back to this question of what it means if we let the machines make the decisions, something that's highly controversial and I'll talk about in a few moments. Because I think military robotics essentially raise you know, four questions. Now the first is what will drive innovation in robotics? This gets back to the what kind of innovation sort of is this? The second is, who makes the decision about whether to use force? Right now, even when a US Reaper or a Predator flies above uh, 10,000 feet above uh, an alleged terrorist house and, and fires ammunition into the roof, there's still a person pressing the button and a lawyer next to them. But I mean, you got to have lawyers. But what if that Reaper or Predator could make that decision for itself? Who then is legally liable? Sort of what does that mean? So leads to this third question, are military robotics legal? And even if they're legal, are they moral? Would you want to use robots that could make decisions for themselves, even if you, even if you have the ability to do so? 
And then what does this mean for us? What does this mean for a country like the United States? What does it mean for the world? Because robotics could be especially challenging for an American military that's the best in the world at, at manned fighting. Manned fighters, manned carriers, manned submarines, personnel on the ground. Robotics could force changes in everything that the military does. Recruiting, training, retention, all those sorts of things, which can make it extremely disruptive then for a great power sort of like the United States. And just to be clear, what I'm talking about here is not really about drones. For those of you that have you know, popped open the, the New York Times on, on, on probably any day over the last couple of years and heard about you know, so-called drone strikes. You know, drone strikes in places like Pakistan, Afghanistan have led to a lot of uh, protest, a lot of people upset both in the United States and abroad, and a lot of dead terrorists, to be fair. But the current generation of drones are very limited. They're really slow. They can't protect themselves if they're attacked, and they're really easy to track. They don't have anything in the way of sort of stealth capabilities. What I'm interested in essentially is what does it look like as our investment moves from this into the next generation? So this is about where things are going. So what's gonna drive innovation in robotics? One thing we know is that the commercial sector is charging hard. There are uh, sort of four things up here. One uh, down here is, uh, I don't know why exactly you need a robot to do this, but this is a robotic hamburger maker that can make 365 hamburgers in an hour. Um, this is Baxter, whose eyes are creepy. I mean, super creepy, but is uh, an advanced industrial robot produced by, I believe, uh, Rethink Robotics. Uh, this is a violin playing robot invented by Toyota, the, the car company, I guess just to demonstrate that they could. And then this is the Roomba, produced by a company called iRobot. And the Roomba's really interesting in thinking about where this sector could move. 10 years ago, if you bought a Roomba, it was way, way more expensive than a regular vacuum cleaner. And it basically would just like roll around your living room, bump into a wall, and stop. <laughs> now, they actually work pretty well, do a totally reasonable job. The technology's advanced. They're still really expensive. But what happens five years from now, maybe 10 years from now, when the unit cost comes down, and they're both as good as and price competitive with you know, the best in, in handheld vacuum cleaners. It's a different way, in, in, in companies like this, there's a lot of money there. So these companies are continue investing in this kind of automated technology, regardless in some ways of what militaries do. This one's my favorite. I want to introduce you to the Atlas robot. Six feet, two inches, 330 pounds, can uh, throw a whole bunch of debris why does this robot exist? It exists for, in theory, something like disaster relief. Imagine the you know, situation like the horrific earthquake in Haiti a few years ago, where in the, in the early days, it was very difficult for first responders to clear debris and get to people trapped under rubble. The idea behind robots like the Atlas is that you can put them into humanitarian disasters and they can save lives in the early days by making it easier for first responders to get to things. These are a couple other robots. All three of these robots, the, the big dog, which could carry the equipment of soldiers, the cheetah, which can re really run really fast. That's about all I can do right now. These are all uh, inventions. They were invented for the US Defense Department by a company called, by a company called Boston Dynamics. Boston Dynamics does not exist as a company anymore because Google bought it. Not only did Google buy Boston Dynamics, Google then said that they weren't interested in having Boston Dynamics work in the defense sector anymore. Think about how much money, getting back to tax day, we spend on our military every year. If a company thinks that the defense sector is so worthless to them that it's not even worth investing in it, that says something about the size of the commercial market. And some people argue that the size of the robotics market worldwide could be $37 billion annually by 2018. Google also bought a, a robot, a company called Shaft. This is a shot of all the different things that Shaft could do. It won a recent uh, US defense robotics competition up and down stairs. That's just sort of meandering in the grass, uh, throwing debris and driving. And Google's now pulled this out of 
future U.S. defense competitions because want, it wants to take their engineers and do things more relevant for the commercial sector. And it's not just commercial companies that are investing in this. This is a video uh, produced by the GRASP lab at Penn from the engineering department. The first ever uh, indoor demonstration, as far as I know, of a drone swarm. Note the sort of coordinative, creepy, kind of bug-like movement of these tiny little robots. Now imagine that they're armed. Now imagine that they're 10 times bigger, they're armed, and they're moving through airspace. This is a tremendously, tremendously interesting technology, and I'm, I'm proud that professors at Penn are on the leading edge of doing this research, but demonstrates that in both the commercial sector and in the educational sector, research in robotics, advances in robotics are basically going to happen. And they're going to happen regardless of what the military does. So let's go back to the military. Let's go back to that, that, MQ-9, uh, that MQ-9 Reaper that I talked about before, the, the leading edge of armed UAVs around the world. Note the, note the design here. This is important. Okay. All right, everybody got this? Remember this? Now look at this. This looks like the same thing, except for that. It's called the Wing Loon. That's a Chinese UAV that was first deployed in early June uh, 2013 at the Paris Air Show, demonstrating that maybe um, some interesting things about um, industrial espionage, but uh, more importantly, I mean, who knows, of course, uh, more importantly that, that a country like, like China and then several other countries, if you think about Israel and its super heron, or other sorts of investments, are catching up to where the United States is now. So the United States looks at this and says, don't worry about it. We're going to leap ahead. So that Paris Air Show was in early June 2013. In late June 2013, the US did what is, up to this point, the most amazing thing any country has done with military robotics. And that is essentially using an algorithm, you know, not human assisted, really, this, this aircraft, an ex a test aircraft called the X-47B, landed on an aircraft carrier. Landing on an aircraft carrier is, is difficult for even the best pilots in the world. That we could basically program a machine to do it is unbelievable. And also note the shape of this, which would enable it to potentially be a little bit stealthy, a little bit faster, to overcome those disadvantages in drones that I talked about before. All right, so we're ahead, right? Well, four months later, China tested that. It's called the Sharp Sword. And while they haven't shown that they could, it can take off and land from an aircraft carrier, carrier I mean, heck, their, their pilots can kind of barely do that right now, uh, it does demonstrate that this technology is not monopolized by the United States. This is not something where just the US military is invested in other countries are simply not involved. Other countries are charging hard in this. And all of that commercial investment is going to enable it. Because the dual use underlying nature of robotics technology means that as that technology spreads around the world for perfectly reasonable commercial capitalist reasons, it will make it easier for militaries around the world to take advantage of that technology uh, as well. And this is not just about then those you know, things flying through the air. On the top, we have the knife fish. It's an unmanned underwater vehicle that the US Navy is developing to try to detect mines that uh, seek to destroy US ships. Uh, in the middle, we have the Guardium. This is a border patrol robot with a weapon on it deployed by Israel to guard Israel's border and protect it from uh, infiltration. On the bottom, we have something which may or may not really exist called the Ariana which is an Iranian unmanned surface vehicle. And when people talk about how they're worried about Iran, for example, sending swarms of boats after US ships in the Persian Gulf, this is the kind of thing that they're talking about. This next generation of unmanned systems, of robotic systems, and thinking about what that will mean for the future of war. So the way to think about it is go back to that robot that I said that I liked a lot before. You know, remember the Atlas robot? This is the Karata. This is a Japanese robot that, that a, now to be fair, this was a PR stunt, and it worked because I was still talking, I'm still talking about it two years later. But a Japanese company basically built this robot and then put rocket launchers on the end. 
and machine guns on the end. Now, to be fair, they were just firing BBs. They weren't firing live munitions. But imagine that six foot two, 330 pound Atlas robot on the battlefield. Imagine it with weapons. Imagine it controlled by a soldier, you know, a soldier back home. You know, what that would mean for the future uh, of warfare. And now imagine that the machines start making decisions for themselves. Now, as I mentioned before, obviously in the movies, you know, the Terminator, not, you know, not necessarily our friend. It gets to this question of who decides to use force? Who gets to make the decision? Right now, all the systems that a country like the United States de deploys involve either what's called a man in the loop, which means there's a person, you know, directly making the decision about whether to fire or what's called a man on the loop. With a man on the loop, the machine might be able to fire, but there's a human on top of it the whole time with essentially a, a kill switch that can actually control it. What if you take the human out of the loop? What if using algorithms or artificial intelligence advances in those areas, robotic systems are able to essentially think for themselves even in a limited way? And there are systems that exist now that can do just that in a very limited, prosaic kind of fashion. Israel, for example, deploys an unmanned aerial system called the Harpy, which once up in the air essentially hovers and looks for a particular type of radar. And when it sees that radar, it can itself find that radar, lock onto that radar, and attack it, and try to destroy that radar. So autonomous weapon systems are not just necessarily the thing of the future, there's something that some countries are working on right now, which has led many to argue that the United States should ban these kinds of systems, should lead the charge to ban killer robots. After all, isn't this in our interest? The United States is the best in the world, after all, the way that wars are fought now. Maybe we can stay ahead in military robotics. Why would we ever want machines making decisions? There's some truth to that, absolutely some truth to that. The problem is that just doing this the way that the NGO community would, would like us to, is more difficult than you might imagine at first. Now, for example, how can you tell the difference between a UAV controlled by a pilot back at Creech Air Force Base and an actual robot making decisions for itself? That's in software, not in hardware, which means the traditional kinds of ways that we do things like arms control by, say, counting the number of weapons that Russia has and then counting the number that the US has and making sure that they match up wouldn't really be possible. And other countries have incentives to develop these systems. I mean, what's the worst case for a country like the United States? Imagine a situation where we're fighting a war against a large land power in East Asia and the US sends up the, the best of our future force, the best of our future Air Force, F-22s, F-35s, all the bells and whistles and they shoot down an adversary's aircraft at a ratio of, of, say, 10 to 1 or even 15 to 1. But imagine that our adversary's systems, they're using those swarms that I showed you before, and the cost differential in building them is 20 to 1 or 25 to 1. That's a cost curve that the United States would be on the wrong side of, which is why, even though it's not necessarily in America's interest, it might be better if these things never existed, if others are going to look into them anyway, there's a case to be made that the United States should not allow itself then to be left behind. So then what then will this mean for the United States? I think it's important to keep in mind here that military superiority is something that we, we often take for granted now when thinking about the United States military. We take for granted that when our soldiers deploy abroad, that they don't have to worry about other, other countries' aircraft bombing them because the US Air Force has already shot them out of the sky. We don't worry about when our troops are going to war on a surface ship, that it'll be sunk by a submarine the way that they would have been at risk of in World War II because we control the ocean. Other countries have controlled things in the past too, though. This is a shot of the uh, HMS Prince of Wales, a British ship. Uh, you know, deployed by, you know, the leading naval power in the world up to that point, sank by the Japanese early on in World War II, demonstrating that battleships 
were no longer the future of war. It was about aircraft carriers. This is actually a, a depiction of um, uh, Agincourt, uh, the battle in 1415 where the English deployment of the longbow, considered immoral at the time, unethical. How can you, how can you not allow knights to fight against each other? Provided the English with a decisive victory when they, were, when they were overmatched person for person, sort of by the French. And so what you don't want is a situation where you want to avoid, what we want to avoid is a situation where the very technologies that have delivered American military superiority for the last generation end up holding the US military back over the next generation because the US doesn't invest sufficiently in robotic technology and other sorts of new technologies that will be disruptive, but potentially necessary to thinking about the future. So last slide, three takeaways. If you only remember three things, because I can only ever remember three things. First thing, good news story if you're an American, the United States is in the lead when it comes to military robotics. And that's not a situation that will change in the short term. The, the benefit of America's early investment in these technologies means that the United States is likely to remain ahead unless it does something really, really dumb. But the second thing is that as military robotics advance, as robotic systems can increasingly either complement or replace some manned systems, and as the potential for autonomous weapon systems moves from science fiction to reality, this is gonna lead to a lot of hard choices about where the United States should be investing and even what it means to go to war anymore. And I think it's important for the United States and the world to grapple with these things. Because robotics could end up being something akin to the combustion engine of the 21st century. Something that underlies basically everything that we do in civilian society, in the civilian economy, and in the military. So failing to keep up in this realm could end up putting US military superiority at risk, and there would also potentially be knock-on economic consequences as well. And with that, I will stop, and I look forward to your questions. So the question is, the US is supposed to have the best military in the world, but it's not like we always win our wars. Vietnam, not so good. Afghanistan, <laughs> Afghanistan, also not going so well. Iraq, maybe didn't go so well. The, the challenge for the United States military is, I mean, in all three of those campaigns, actually, is that the US military has remained oriented toward, oriented toward winning the interstate portion of wars, the wars, the part of the war against other nation states. It was easy for us to take out the Taliban in 2001. It was easy for the US military to take out the Iraqi military in 2003. It's what comes next when the United States uh, decides to engage in nation building that's proven extremely difficult. It's a costly, time-consuming, difficult enterprise and one that the United States has had a lot of difficulty mastering over the years. So the countries that I talked about here, I mean, I think the, um, the, the, the specter of China uh, was, you know, sort of heavily hung over, over this, and that the, the country that, whose military spending is starting to approach that of the United States, and whose investments in robotics are approaching that of the United States, is, is China. The US Security and Economic Review Commission, for example, last year, uh, published a report uh, detailing the investments that China's making in its sort of unmanned systems across the board. And the Defense Science Board, which is the most, you know, sort of senior scientific body that uh, gives the United States military advice on the future of technology, has called China's developments in these sorts of technologies alarming. But it's not just China. The thing about robotics that I think is fascinating is that imagine European countries not spending a lot on their militaries right now, in part because labor costs are really high, and in part because they have difficulty doing a lot of recruiting. Robotics potentially offer a way forward for some of those countries, a way to substitute for the fact 
that, that they have labor issues. And it's why a country like Poland, for example, has talked openly in the last year about getting rid of some of its older Su-22 fighters and replacing them with unmanned systems. So it's not just sort of China charging hard in this area, it's also some of our European friends and partners, and it's also some of our friends in Asia. Any country, essentially, with an advanced information age industrial ar architecture could become a defense producer in the age of robotics. Because the underlying technology is going to be a lot more similar, the underlying military and commercial technologies are going to be a lot more similar than they've been over the previous generation or two, making it easier for, say, a company like Samsung to shift from commercial production to military production if it chooses to do so. I don't think so. Russia's actually lagged in its development of military robotics, in part because their, com their conventional defense industry has been you know, a bit in tatters over the last generation. So they haven't invested a lot in advanced technologies. Now, that being said, over the last year, Russia's talked about doing two things with robotics that seem particularly interesting. One is we worry a lot about the security of Russia's ballistic missiles. You know, we wouldn't want them to get in the hands of terrorists or you know, loose nuclear material, all those things. They're good, they've said that they're going to deploy uh, unmanned ground vehicles that are armed to protect those bases. And the second thing is they're talking about deploying unmanned airships, actually, in the Arctic to monitor what other countries are doing as uh, climate change continues to lead to melting and a lot of sort of transition in that, in that part of the world. So here's something that's sort of interesting. When you, that, that ban killer robots campaign that I talked about before, they're not interested in drones at all, but they're, they're interested in essentially, a, you know, robots making decisions for themselves, autonomous weapon systems. And one of the things that they're really worried about, and I think they're right to be worried about it, is that, uh, you know, a future Terminator will be marching down the battlefield. Their propaganda is great. That, you know, a future Terminator is going to march down the battlefield and won't be able to tell the difference between, you know, little Susie and an, an enemy combatant. Uh, and that's a real concern, and one of the reasons why countries like the United States have, have, have essentially, are, are not investing in a lot of these technologies. The, one of the questions, though, is would, presuming the technology improves, would those robots be worse than scared 18-year-old kids at doing that job? I don't know. Maybe they would, maybe they wouldn't. But to me, that's an empirical question, one that will... We, we, we should try to figure out in sort of discrimination kind of testing as, as the technology uh, advances. I think there are actually a lot of interesting questions that this is going to raise about what is actually likely to lead to, say, what we all want, you know, fewer civilian casualties. That's a great question. I think simple autonomy is certainly going to be possible. It's, it's possible now. Simple autonomy is possible now. I think that more, more complex forms of autonomy are, you know, could come down the road. They'll depend on some important scientific breakthroughs, you know, some of which were, we certainly haven't gotten there yet. But I would say more like a decade to two decades, potentially, on some of, the, on some of those types of advances that, that could even enable, whether or not you wanted to do them again is a different question, sort of more advanced forms of autonomy. And, but to, go, to get to your comment, though, I think it's actually worth dwelling on for a second in that there's a... When we talk about how things like drone strikes lead to a lot of collateral damage, there are really actually two types of strikes. And how we think about collateral damage should be different in them. The first are cases where the United States would use force anyways. And the options are essentially a UAV, uh, a manned team, or a manned fighter. And in those cases, you know, system for system, the system least likely to produce, produce collateral damage is the UAV because it can hover above the target. It can tell, for example, if, the, if a terrorist sort of wife and family are walking away from, uh, walking away from a house then, and then hit the house. It's not something a man team could do or, uh, or a fighter can do. The second, though, are strikes where we would not be using force except for the fact that US soldiers are not at risk. And it's in those kinds of cases that essentially any collateral damage is collateral damage that comes from using UAVs, using drones. So I think there's an important distinction there.
So the, the question is, how worried am I about non-state actors and their ability to use this technology? The answer is very worried. And the reason is, I mean, this was kind of a publicity stunt, but when the CEO of Amazon talked about using quadcopters to deliver packages to us, I mean, that's kind of cool, a little scary that, you know, that the, the UAV kind of hovering over you and then like, I mean, it's dropping Amazon goodness and so that's good. But the, the, the challenge is, but if, if that technology is so ubiquitous, then it, that means anybody can get it. And, and if you combine that with the fact that GPS is cheap and easy to get, and some of those really easy to get military technologies that, you know, say the, the AK-47, which I talked about before, rocket launchers, other types of things. The ability of non-state actors, I think the ability is high for non-state actors to be able to leverage some of these technologies, especially on the low end, to conduct different types and potentially more dangerous types of attacks than they've had the ability to do. I think it's actually a, a significant concern and not one at the end of the day you can do a lot about unless you're going to try to shut down the commercial robotics industry. So the, if you want to be a pessimist, the, the statistic you should use to be a pessimist is the fact that in the Unmanned Systems Roadmap published by the Department of Defense in December 2013, it suggested that there will be a 33.4%, I think 33.4% cut in U.S. investment in the research and development and procurement of all sort of unmanned systems, so not just aerial systems, but all unmanned systems, in 2014. That's the, that's, that's the bad news, you know, kind of story for that. The good news story is that the United States does remain committed to investing in these kinds of technologies. The challenge is that in a period where the economy isn't doing so well, and with sequestration, which is chopping essentially $500 billion off of the defense budget over 10 years, it's easy to cut the thing that's experimental, the thing that's unproven, the thing that doesn't have as big a constituency or interest group. So that's why I think you know, military robotics could actually be at risk, but there are a lot of people committed to it. For example, the incoming Deputy Secretary of Defense, uh, Robert Work, is one of the premier defense intellectuals in this area. And his appointment, I think, is a good news story for the willingness of the United States to invest increasingly scarce defense dollars in this kind of technology. So, I mean, essentially, if, you're if I'm worried about the spread of robotics and the underlying commercial basis of robotics, I should probably be really worried about cyber then, essentially. And, and to some extent, I think there's a lot of truth there. The, you know, one of the things the Stuxnet virus and, you know, other sorts of things showed was that, you know, advanced computing, you know, used for, you know, could have significant, you know, militarily significant consequences if used in um, creative, why don't we say, sort of ways. I think that the, and this is something, again, that, that non-state actors, that other kinds of countries will be able to, to take advantage of. From an American perspective, one thing I can tell you from being in the Defense Department last year is that you know, I was there during a time of significant budgetary pressure, the sequestration and a government shutdown and the defense budget coming down anyways. The, the thing that the, that the Defense Department was most committed to funding in some ways is cyber defense, is you know, building up America's cyber capabilities. So it's an area that is going to remain a priority for investment because every, essentially everybody is, I think, internalized this fact. You know, the, the, you know, the person, you know, the, the unemployed genius with a modem can re, you know, could penetrate the Defense Department servers. There's some truth to that. And because of that, we are investing a lot of resources in attempting to protect ourselves to the best, best extent we can, recognizing, of course, that no system is, is ever going to be perfect. So we asked the, the Atlas robot that I showed before, what did the Atlas robot actually cost? The Atlas robot actually wasn't all that. I mean, so the Atlas robot was funded as part of this, I think actually ingenious thing that, the, that DARPA, the experimental arm of the Defense Department does where they hold essentially competitions where they say, you know, anybody can enter and those who build something good enough that it can pass, you know, a certain set of benchmarks will then give a prize to 
or fund further research in that area. And so Atlas was built for, for one of those kinds of competitions. I mean, my guess would be it may have cost a couple million dollars to build. Now, of course, if we built a military version of Atlas, it would cost like 20 times that. But um, not that our defense acquisition system has problems. But the, but no, I mean, in all seriousness, the, I'm sure a, 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 a real world militarized version of that kind of robot would cost more because the Atlas robot now is a, is a test bed. It's experimental. It, it, it can do things that are amazing for a robot, like climb up stairs, clear debris. But it still, say, it still you know, stumbled in that DARPA competition when walking over a two by four. So there's a lot further for that technology to go, and chances are it will get a little more expensive. I mean, all I can tell you is what the facts on the ground look like for a country like China, who's significantly investing in it. It's true that, that a country like China in the macro sense probably views its comparative advantage as being labor over capital, because of course they have you know, many people, as you said, but they're more concerned, but all of those people don't necessarily help them in dealing with American air superiority or American naval superiority. And I think they, they view robotics as a way to counter the United States in those areas where more people don't necessarily help them which is why they're investing, why a country like China, I think, is so interested in investing in those areas. And in addition, you have smaller, smaller countries that are investing a lot. Singapore, uh, Israel, uh, South Korea, in, in part maybe because North Korea has so many more people. So there are lots of countries that are investing in this, in this, sort, of, uh, in this sort of technology, regardless of what the United States does. And it's just going to get easier as, as the commercial spread of the technology enables m much more production by other, by, by defense actors around the world. Well, people like you are why the United States military is the best in the world, and, and, and thank you for your service. I don't think, I don't think anybody's talking about replacing, actually replacing the trigger pullers, especially replacing the trigger pullers that are, that are on the ground. One of, the, one, of the interest, one of the most interesting statements on all of this actually came from the Army. About four months ago, uh, General Cohn, who was then the head of a TRADOC, the Army's Training Command, talked about reducing the size of a brigade combat team, the sort of basic organizing force element of the Army, from 4,000 to 3,000 over a period of about, of about a decade, with the idea being actually to try to provide the warfighter more eyes and ears and ground support by, by pulling those people out and using robotics for more logistical functions, more back office functions essentially, to free up more resources for the, for the people on the ground. And so I think actually from an army perspective, what robotics could look like in the future or will be actually very helpful to, to someone like you and your, and, your, you and your future units rather than uh, detrimental. But the, the places where I think you're likely to see and where it could end up being potentially helpful are in things like evacuate, evacuating uh, personnel, evacuating injured personnel in a, in a place where, say, it might be very difficult to get a manned helicopter in there, or being able to take people out of dangerous convoy situations because you can use essentially remotely driven MRAPs, Humvees, you know, those sorts of systems to be able to move a material from point A to point B. I think those are things that the Army's talking about now that could end up saving, and I hope, end up saving some of your soldiers' lives uh, down the road. But it's a great point and a great perspective that we should all keep in mind. Thank you, Dr. Horowitz. Let's thank our speaker.